Las Vegas has two new resort and casinos with the grand openings of Fountain Blue and Durango mean for Southern Nevada's economy. That's this week on Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt. Welcome to Nevada Week. I'm Amber Renee Dixon. What do the openings of Fountain Blue and Durango Resort and Casino indicate about the economy? We explore that ahead, but first we take a trip to Fountain Blue, Las Vegas. Developers acquired land for the $3.7 billion resort all the way back in 2000. Now, after multiple setbacks and owners, the 67-story hotel on the north end of the Las Vegas Strip is finally open. Nevada Week sat down with its COO, Colleen Birch. Well, congratulations on this opening, more than 20 years in the making. What do you think distinguishes Fountain Blue Las Vegas from all the other resorts on the Las Vegas Strip? Thanks for being here and super excited to share our story. I, uh, you know, we are a fully integrated resort, tallest habitable building in Las Vegas. That so gives us a little bit of bragging rights at 67 floors up. Um, meeting space that's over the top in our adjacency to the West Hall of the Convention Center across the way. And what I really think sets us most apart, uh, you know, the, the building itself is beautiful and our food and beverage programming is going to be over the top, but it's our people that set this place apart. Well, tell me more about that because I know you are very unique in your hiring methods and your outlook on that. Investing in culture and investing in hiring, making sure people are very good fits for our business was incredibly and will be incredibly important for our success here. So we've coined a phrase that's polite with the personality. This idea that you can you can have offer great, great service, um, but if we do a good job of getting to know our guests and we let our guests know a little bit something about the members, we call ourselves members versus employees, we don't believe that membership is unique to somebody who's um, you know, part of our, our loyalty program. We are all members of Fountain Blue Las Vegas. How many positions do you have left to fill? How many have you filled? Gosh, I think we're about 5896 uh, in our member count and peak season. So we've got the pool season just right around the corner and it'll push us over that 6,000 mark. Okay, so that's what 6,000 total is what you're looking for? Yes. yes. A lot of people, members who are just so excited to open our doors tonight and really show this city what what is uh, I think the best kept secret. Now that outlook on hiring and your methods, um, is that something that developed as a result of properties having trouble getting workers to come back after COVID? Or is that something that's existed in Fountain Blue's long history? What? You know, when I joined this project in November of last year, you know, working with leadership team and, and you know, our, our senior vice president of people, Kim Virtuoso, was a, an exceptional partner in this process for me. Um, but the, coming up with, with criteria of who, who do we want in this building and what, what is going to resonate with our guests, uh, we, we felt we needed to do something a little bit different than your typical career fairs and just allowing kind of a first come, first serve. We really wanted to be specific about who we were selecting to join this team. So what did you do different? I'll tell you what, before you, before you even got to interview for your job, you came in for an audition, just a culture audition, we called it. So we were gauging who you are as a person um, and, and you know, trying to figure out, do you have hospitality in your heart? Uh, and then if you don't, we... We sent you some, we, we politely, you know, said it's probably not a good fit for us. And then the second round of that was sitting down with leaders who needed to talk to you about the skills to actually do a given job. But I'm a firm believer that you can teach the skills and, and, and teaching hospitality is a little bit more difficult. I mentioned the long history of Fountain Blue. So the original location, Miami Beach, uh, opened about 70 years ago. Are there influences of Miami Beach here at this property? Absolutely. So I'll tell you what, Fountain Blue, Miami Beach uh, will turn 70 next year in December. So we get to partake in the 70th anniversary of such an iconic brand. There are definitely some pull throughs from Miami as, uh, as it relates to Fountain Blue Las Vegas. So the columns that you see in our casino floor, those are the same lobby columns 
Islands in Fountain Blue, Miami Beach. We've got a blue bar uh, here. Every, everything in Las Vegas is a, a little bit larger, as we know, so our blue bar is larger than theirs. But I'll tell you what, they've got a great legacy there in terms of um, who they have hosted and how they have made people feel. And, and we plan to do that very same thing. Will you tell me about this sculpture behind us? So a gentleman named Erst Fisher is, is the artist and there's murals above and, and one on this other side as well. Um, this is called, this is part of his Lovers series and this is the third Lovers sculpture. Um, I, that's about as much as I know. I'll tell you what, I'm excited to meet him. I think he's in the building. I haven't met him yet, but I'm gonna sit down and make him help me understand what, what was going through his mind. I just think it's stunning. And this welcome reception here uh, in our South Lobby, just adjacent to the, the West Hall, and our meeting spaces just above us. I think it's just a stunning, stunning piece of art. It does, it, it stops you in your tracks. So 2008 is when construction on this property halted. Didn't resume until 2021. How dramatically did the plans change between 2008 to 2021? The bones of the building were still here and, and I think it was a bit of a, a myth that this building hadn't been taken care of in all of those years. That is absolutely not, not accurate. So there was, a, there was maintenance in a way that, that allowed us to pick up the pieces when our ownership group uh, came back into the fold in, 20, in 2021. I'll tell you what, the, it was really the design that um, changed a little bit. So, you know, original design, there were some people in town, uh, the plaza actually bought some carpet and some, some of our furniture when we shuttered. I say we because I was a part of this property for nine months in 2008 until, it, uh, until the property halted in, in June of 2009. But the, um, you know, the, art, the, the renderings that, that or our artistic choices kind of has changed just because the climate has changed and, you know. Right, I would imagine. Users' tastes have changed. Uh -huh. Things are cool now that weren't cool in 2008. <laughs> <laughs> and for locals who have driven past the unfinished building for more than a decade, thinking of it as an eyesore, as a reminder of the Great Recession, how do you go about changing their attitudes, or do you? Oh, absolutely. I think you'll you'll walk in the store or even drive by. I mean, we have a commitment to the exterior as, as in, in as much detail as we do on the inside. Amazing landscape and actually a, a beautiful art installation at the southwest corner if you haven't seen that. Uh, so I, I, I really just believe it'll be one time in this building and then you'll say, wow. And finally, you are contributing to the development of the north end of the Las Vegas Strip. What else would you like to see here that will ultimately help drive business to Fountain Blue Las Vegas? Well, we've got a, a vacant lot adjacent to us. Our ownership group talks, and, and, and I, I think it would be lovely if we, we purchased that land so that we could be in control of what happens just north of us. But you would like to do something on your own over there. Gosh, if we had our, our, our choice, yes. I mean, is that in the works? Uh, I think it's an idea, but I, I think that would be premature. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. Now, Fountain Blue's grand opening comes a little more than a week after Durango Resort and Casino celebrated its own grand opening. On Durango's marquee, a message congratulating Fountain Blue, a nice touch. Located in the southwest part of the valley, Durango took almost two years to complete with a $750 million price tag. More than 1,200 employees were hired in time for the grand opening. Nevada Week's Maria Silva takes us inside the newest Station Casino's property. Amber, it's always an exciting time when a new property opens up. People are waiting outside for hours, just waiting for those doors to open up. And I can tell you, we are so lucky to get a VIP tour. And here to tell us all about it is Dave Horn, the Vice President and General Manager. Hi. Let's talk about this beautiful place. Yes. Worth the wait. Um, it is. It's uh, a lot of... Uh... Uh, emotion and passion project and 19 months in the making to get this thing going it's a uh, it's a worth the wait for sure what makes this place so special and sets it apart from any other place well it's uh, we've done a lot of different things from a luxury brand standpoint to we you know the finishes the marble that's extensively used everywhere our lighting some of the artistic treatments but more importantly what the content is you know the restaurants and the rooms and uh, what we've done for those treatments that's what's going to set it apart as a new uh, new generation. And let's talk a little bit where we're at right now. Earlier during our tour, when you were giving us a VIP tour, your face just lit up when you were talking about this area. 
Well, it's gaming. That's my background. <laughs> it's uh, what I've been doing for the better part of my time with this company. And I see how this pit is designed and how we laid it out. The lighting, our high limit, our gaming salons. I just think it's a beautiful pit for everybody to enjoy. I can't wait for them to see it. And let's talk also about your sports book over there. That place is pretty awesome. Inside, outside, there's so much to see and do. For sure, it is. And it's, you know, everybody has something new in, in, for sports books, but for us, it's an intimate setting. I, I've said this many times, it's a place you can bring a date, which wasn't always something to consider, but with what we did with the George, with the all-encompassing viewing, there's no bad seat in that venue. The George Patio, I think we've made our racing sports book one of the best in the city. And let's talk a little bit also about your different restaurants. You have so many different options, starting with Eat Your Heart Out over there. Yeah, so the, our, eat, our Eat Your Heart Out Hall of Foods, uh, 10 different venues, including our drink bar. We brought Oyster Bar from Palace. We have uh, you know, an exciting array of family loan operations from the city. Outside from California, you've got burgers, you've got pizza. I can list them on if you want me to, and there's so many, but it's gonna be unlike anything anybody's seen. And I can tell you, I had a big smile. I'm a foodie, I love to eat. That oyster bar just has my heart. So I was For happy sure. to see that. Yes. <laughs> and let's talk about some of your other restaurants that you have in, in here as well. So we have the George, which is uh, next to the sports book, as mentioned. That's gonna be in a kind of an upscale uh, racing sports bar feel. We have Definitely a brunch place. Yeah, for sure, the patio is perfect for that. We have our Nico Steakhouse, which is just top level. It's unlike anything we've done before. It's a very vibey room. It's The food's gonna be great. We have the Mijo Mexican restaurant. Uh, with all of these, by the way, having fantastic patio options as you tour each restaurant. And then we have our Summer House, which is gonna be, same thing, very hot brunch spot, excellent patios, great food. And let's talk about those rooms. The rooms are very nice. A lot of work went into the comparisons to make sure that we had a luxury product and that the, fit, the finish and the treatments, the mattresses, the sheets, the pillows, everything is something you say, okay, this feels like it's luxury. Yeah, and you great views as well. That's right, we have a, if you go to the north side of this tower, you have panoramic views from Red Rock Canyon all the way to the Strip. And can I tell you, I geeked out, you have espresso machines in the rooms. <laughs> we do, that was uh, definitely a must. And this is what's also great about this location, it's really centrally located when you think about from the Strip, so you will be expecting to get a lot of tourists and visitors coming this way. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people underestimate that that drive from the airport uh, or to Allegiant or to T-Mobile is very short. And that puts us in a good spot, you know, as a tourist coming in here, coming off the strip to enjoy the city. And then from a local standpoint, you have four-way access to it, so it's very easy. We have to talk about New Year's Eve. We have to talk about the big game coming up. You guys are already sold out for that. Yeah, we, we have done pretty well in booking and uh, we're still booking a lot of our players, but from a general population standpoint, it's going fast. And you know, it's, we're opening into busy time, New Year's Eve, Super Bowl, like you said, we aren't gonna get a break. And last but not least, let's talk about our locals. That's what you guys, it's part of your brand, that's what you're all about. What message do you have for the locals? We are ready to blow your socks off. Our team is ready more than anything. That's what makes us great is our guest service and our team members. And everybody is so excited to see the locals and the regulars that they've known at the other properties they've worked at and to see all the new people we're ready to bring in. All right, so I, we're going to continue with this VIP tour. Amber, again, definitely a must-see. It is phenomenal. It is beautiful in here at Durango Casino Resort. All right, we'll see you later. Ready to tour? Let's I'm continue. ready. Let's go. VIP. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the openings of these resort and casinos should be signs that the economy is strong, right? But what about those fears of recession? We bring in Andrew Woods now. He's the director of UNLV's Center for Business and Economic Research. Andrew, welcome. Thank what you, do these openings indicate to you about Southern Nevada's economy and the economy overall? Well, I appreciate being on here and thank you for the question. Uh, I still think that it shows that Nevada is a good bet for the leisure and hospitality industry. Uh, seeing that the, we have these openings, we also have expansions going on at the same time. Um, we've rebounded from the pandemic much better than we had initially anticipated at the Center for Business and Economic Research. So it continues to show that the economy continues to grow. Certainly there are some scars that we see from both the Great Recession still to this day and from the pandemic, and those certainly have us concerned, but it still continues to show that leisure and hospitality is a main driver of our economy. It counts for one in four jobs here in Southern Nevada. It counts for one in three dollars generated out of Southern Nevada is that industry. So it's still very important for our economy and our prosperity. 
which makes a potential recession even scarier, though, for Southern Nevada. What are you hearing about that possibility? You and I have been talking about that possibility for more than a year now. So CBER does not forecast a recession in the near term at the, at the moment. Um, we do update that forecast quarterly, so things can change very quickly. We do have concerns that, you know, is, from the elevated spending levels at some point that will have to kind of cool down a bit as we see with higher interest rates. We see higher credit card interest rates. We see that the cost of living is still significant. And I would say that inflation's not done. Um, we're certainly better than we were a year, year and a half ago when it was 9%. Now we're at 3.1% headline inflation. Um, I, I do think that there are concerns that we will things will cool here in the coming months and that the record sales tax and record gaming revenue is probably going to cool down and we're seeing some of those early indicators. That doesn't mean that we're forecasting recession though either at the moment. Okay, so a cool down if that does happen. We haven't seen it yet though as we discussed with Christmas shopping numbers, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, people love, we, we all love to holiday shop. Uh, and they have come out much stronger than we realized uh, or anticipated. So I know just from Cyber Monday, Shop Small Saturday, Black Friday, it was about $12 billion spent. And they're estimating a record for the quarter of about $966 billion spent on holiday spending from Halloween all the way to New Year. Um, which is still pretty incredible that the American consumer, I have to thank them for continuing to keep us all afloat and continue moving forward. There are some interesting figures though in that. For example, some of the excess spending tends to be coming from the top 20% of it, individuals from an income level. So the bottom 80% have pulled back, are doing more substitution effect, aren't spending as much. So it's coming more from the top at the moment. Uh, it also seems to be coming from uh, the baby boomers. The baby boomers tend to also to, to splurge as we would say. Um, and that, to be fair, that's keeping the economy going, but it does give us hesitation for the rest of us that we're kind of pulling back at some point. We'll all have to pull back, and what does that mean after the, after the new year? But we said that last year, and the American consumer continued to truck along through 2023. Um, we'll just have to see how 2024 pans out. And we were talking about consumer spending habits off camera. You brought up uh, buy now and pay later. Yes. It's become more prevalent. Yeah, so we saw a 47% increase during the kind of Black Friday through Cyber Monday period of this trend where you're, you know, you buy the product now and you pay for it later. And if you don't pay for it later, they charge you interest. So it instantly then turns into like essentially a loan and you're paying much higher interest than you would be paying, say, three years ago um, because of higher interest rates. And so we see the prevalence of that. It makes us wonder. Uh, and especially the ease of access to those if we're setting ourselves up for debt to kind of really pick up here. We already had a trillion dollars in credit card debt, which is a record. Um, and you have to imagine all those outstanding uh, outstanding uh, debt has now a higher interest rate to it. So it's not just simply that consumers might have more debt. They're also going to be paid more on that debt if they have an outstanding balance. So this buy more, pay later that might make sense for like large purchases that you pay off over time and you can do some periodic payments. But if you miss that payment, you're immediately going to be hit with a much higher interest rate than you've probably anticipated and what you were paying, say, three years ago. Hmm. Uh, back to the Durango and the Fountain Blue openings, what kind of impact do they have on the local economy? Well, they, they several, right? So again, mentioning that one in four jobs and one in three dollars from Southern Nevada comes from Eastern Hospitality, you're adding 3,644 rooms from the, the Durango, sorry, not from the Durango, from the Font Blue. Though I, I'm, I am curious if they're fully open in terms of all those rooms, but we know for every room out there, you're creating about 1.1 jobs in the economy. So you're up here about 4,000 jobs at least from Font Blue, maybe more than that. And then with the Durango, they right now have 211 rooms. So you can, but you, as you said, they have well over a thousand workers they've hired. So at least for their opening, that has an impact, right? Those are salaries. Uh, those, those are obviously also increasing and are inducing demand from visitors to come and spend. That helps with sales tax collection, which for the moment is actually trending a bit downward compared to what we've seen um, as some of the economy cools off. So. It's good to have these going on right now as the economy cools because it's kind of giving a bit of a boost as we go into the end of the year. And we want them to be successful, right? It also, where their place is really interesting, right? These are not necessarily properties being placed right 
where we've typically talked about, like on Tropicana and Las Vegas Boulevard. We're talking about the north end of the Strip, near the Sahara and the Las Vegas Convention Center, kind of having an anchor now that's a little more economically vibrant that can like spur maybe more economic development on that side of the town, but also in the Durango where you've seen a huge, that's where a lot of the population growth for the county is going on is in that southwest part. You see a lot of development and now Stations has built this casino that seems to me to be more catered to locals. Um, and in doing so, it's really saying this part of town is economically flourishing right now. When do you think we see another big type of development like the Fountain Blue again? Well, the Fountain Blue, because it's just, it's so massive, right? I mean, it's like building a Bellagio. I think it's going to be at least a decade or more for the for a si property of that size. I could be wrong. I would love to be wrong. But at the same time, it takes, as we see, it takes a long time now for these properties, not just to be it's not so much of an issue of building them, but getting kind of to a place where they are uh, in the credit market able to get financed and that they're gonna then pay off for the, the consumer or pay off for the investors and then pay off for visitors and pay off for workers and, and the economy kind of fits into that. We're forecasting for 2024 right now about 40 million visitors, which is on par of what we had this year. Um, our record is still above that at close to 43 million. We would be curious of what kind of anchors in terms of events, but also as a community, what infrastructure do we need to start thinking about after we went through F1 and we're gonna have, go through the Super Bowl here and New Year's and NBA and all these other exciting things. We think that there probably needs to be a serious conversation about infrastructure development so that we can push that Legion hospitality number, visitor number above 43 million. Because it seems like we're kind of maxing out right now. You hear the numbers from the airport where they're feeling that they're getting full with 55 plus million uh, people running going through the airport. So if we want to get up to 43, 44, 45, maybe even 50 million visitors, what infrastructure? I think we need to have a serious conversation about light rail, about the monorail, and about boring technology, all of it, and really think about moving both our people, our visitors, our workers, and our and just for you and me, if we want to take the kids to school or we want to go out to eat, be able to get around town and not have to like sacrifice, you know, our mobility just because we also have this industry that really powers our economy. On that note, how excited are you for the Brightline West high-speed rail line from California? Well, it, we're excited for them to get those shovels in the ground. I know they were waiting on this this announcement from the administration, which was very exciting and good for our economy. Again, another three billion dollars toward that project. Yeah. Right. So if those shovels get in the ground and they start building, then I, it shows again that it's a good bet. Leisure and hospitality in Southern Nevada. We think it will help with some of the infrastructure needs of getting people to and from Las Vegas. Uh, it also, it will be interesting to see the economic back and forth between people that live in Nevada and want to go to Southern California either for business or for leisure and vice versa where there may be people doing now business in Nevada who maybe weren't necessarily doing so before but living in California. Could you ever see the point where someone is living in LA perhaps and traveling daily to Las Vegas? I could see that or I could see the opposite, right? right. I could see, you know, uh, not only weekend warrior but potentially, you know, tra commuting back and forth. and. It may help with some of the demand at the airport right now, which is there's still a dominance of flights that go to Burbank and Southern California, but this might ease or ease some of that demand so that we can then focus on other routes that maybe are longer. But I, that's not necessarily my expertise, right? But, okay. But I certainly think it will induce demand in terms of people wanting to come to Southern Nevada over time, especially if, if you know it proves to be a, a successful in terms of and it won't be just as efficient to get people from Southern California to Southern Nevada and back. I did want to add the Fountain Blue told us they've hired about 6,000 people. Oh, wow. Uh, in terms of what that yeah. does for the unemployment rate in Nevada, not much, right? Um, and, and the unemployment rate, so high compared to the rest of the country. Here, 5.4% compared to 3.9% nationally. We remind our viewers why there's that discrepancy. Right. So the or, or reason why we still have a very high structural unemployment rate is there has been this structural shift in the labor market. And essentially what that means is there's been a lot of people on the sidelines of the labor market, particularly prime age workers, particularly so in Nevada. And we've done a lot of research on this, and they particularly seem to be individuals of prime working age more here than more so across than across the country. So meaning 21 to 54 particularly if they are men, they aren't working as quite a high rates as they were as pre-pandemic and as they were prior to the pandemic. 
mm. or sorry, in, for also working where they were across compared to the rest of the country. So in Nevada, we have an issue right now with about 53,000 workers missing from the labor force that we should have if the pandemic hadn't happened, especially those prime age workers, the 21 to 54. And so that is keeping our unemployment rate a little bit unusually high because even though we're getting new jobs, we're backfilling people looking for jobs because people are starting to come off the sideline residents here um, looking for now going back into the labor market. And we still have a lot of work to get those people back in the labor market, but that kind of reflects that very dynamic nature and, and the higher unemployment rate, which also is mimicking the leisure and hospitality unemployment rate nationally. So if you look at Nevada's unemployment rate, it tends to mimic the leisure and hospitality rate across the country. Why aren't people wanting to work here? We're trying to dig into that. We've surveyed and what we found, particularly if they're unemployed, uh, they're saying the number one issue they're having is transportation, of course pay, but also skill development. We think there's a lot of friction in the state. Um, we see a little bit from the survey research that we're doing statewide on this issue is that they may feel, they might have been working in leisure and hospitality before the pandemic. They feel that all they can do then to get back in the job market is leisure and hospitality and they would actually be interested in other jobs and other opportunities. And particularly if they had a college degree, during the pandemic they probably left and it was backfilled by other people coming in who also had a college degree, but they were only going into very specific industries like healthcare, government, which would be public education, et cetera. And so we need to think about the friction of our labor market and how maybe you can work in leisure and hospitality, but let's say you don't want to do that anymore. You can also work in healthcare. You can also work in education. You can also work in government and vice versa. Maybe you do all those things and now you want to go work on the strip, right? I've got to stop you there. We've yes. run out of time. Andrew Woods, thank you so thank much. You, and thank you for watching. For any of the resources discussed, go to VegasPBS.org slash Nevada Week.